Hello and welcome to week six of School English Explained. This is the final week of the course um, and this week we are learning all about writing and how that is done in schools. Let me just share my screens with you. Hope you're all well and having a good, good week and been finding the course useful. So just to remind you then, uh, there's the my email address and the links if you're interested in any of the courses. Now is a good time to be thinking about what you might want to do going into January if you've got the opportunity to. There's lots out there. There's a telephone number as well to go along with that. Uh, recording is approximately 45 minutes long. Just to remind you about our um, role with regards to safeguarding and prevent to keeping yourself safe. And that's something Coventry takes very seriously. Um, and just to remind you of the British values that are taught in the children's school of democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance for others with different faiths and beliefs to our own. Very important. So, as I said, it's week six, and this is all about writing. How did you get on with the grammar stuff last week? It's quite, it's very wordy, isn't it? The grammar stuff, it's quite heavy, but hopefully, as and when your children come to hit some of those things in school now, you'll be able to pick it up and help them and be a bit more informed yourselves. That's that's what we hope for. So let's see then the objectives for today. We're going to look at um, building on your dictionary and thesaurus skills, how we use those. We're going to look at stages of writing, um, how children emerge as writers and how, how they build on that. How to improve writing, and that's right through Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. Different types or genres of writing and some key features and examples of those. I will be looking at shared writing, model guided and independent writing and some ideas to encourage reluctant writers. Not everybody finds writing easy and it's important that we try and help with that. So take a moment just to consider where you'd put yourself um, in the traffic light system with that. Uh, just please bear in mind the task images, there'll be opportunities for you to join in. Please feel free to pause the video um to have a go all for your own reference but just might help you to understand where your children are at if you're having a go at some of these things as well okay so first activity then just to warm ourselves up have a go for me can you put these words into alphabetical order so the words in pink we've got elephant apple zebra and carrot can you put those into alphabetical order for me okay so First, hopefully we've got apple, carrot, elephant, zebra. Okay, just take a moment to think about how you did that. What did you look at? Did you start at the end of the word? Did you start at the beginning of the word? What what knowledge did you re rely upon in order to do that? Let's have a think about it, shall we? A bit tricky now. We've got three lists here to put into alphabetical order. Okay, have a look at that little picture in the top right hand corner. When we talk about alphabetical order, we're talking about going from A to Z, okay? And the order starting at A all the way to Z, okay? When we're doing alphabetical order, we're looking at the order of the letters in the words, okay? So, for instance, if you had the word ant and you had the word zebra, quite clearly the A for ant, the A comes at the start of the alphabet, the Z for zebra, Z comes at the end. So, ant would come before zebra if we're doing alphabetical order. That's in its simplest terms. So, have a look at list one for me. Flute, the purple list this is, flute, butterfly, digger, trumpet, printer. Take a moment to jot those down. Which order, where would you put them in? Or which, which would alphabetical order be? Make your alphabetical order, please. If you need more time, don't forget to pause me. Here we go. Butterfly, digger, flute, printer, trumpet. Again, look at that picture in the top right hand corner if it helps you. The B for butterfly comes before the D for digger before the F for flute, then the P for printer, and then the T for trumpet, if you pick those out, okay? Look at list two then, a little bit trickier. This is the green list. We've got bigger, piano, bird, goat, guitar, and bat. It's a bit trickier this time round because some of those words begin with the same letter. What do we do? We've got bigger and we've got bird. They both begin with a B. What do we do? How do we work it out? We go to the next letter, we go to the second letter, okay? Bearing that in mind, have a little go with list two. Pause me if you need to. Have a little go, see if we can put them in order. Okay. 
Okay. This time then, bat, bigger, bird, goat, guitar, piano. Okay, so if we can't just look at the first letter and the second letter, then we go further into the into the word. Okay, so this time, list three, looking at these words, a bit trickier still, because actually some of the second letters are the same. So then we go to the third letter. Okay, and just a tip, if you've got, for instance, two words and one ends before the other, for instance, if you've got bat and you've got bath, which one comes first? It would be bat, okay, because that's the end of the word. B-A-T is the end, there's nothing else after, okay, whereas bath, B-A-T-H, has another letter, so bat would come first, okay. We'll look at list three, get our answers for list three here. Deaf, death, decade, dither, diver, and driver. In a minute, we'll look at that one in more detail, okay. Just a couple of links here for you um, to dictionary apps. I would recommend that you get a real live dictionary, um, a paper one, because it's really good for children to be able to thumb their way through and find and see all these things, you know, to see alphabetical order by looking at the letters one after the other. Um, so if you can do, but obviously there are online apps that you can get for your tablets and things and online dictionaries that you can use to, and we'll look at more of those in more detail, but there's a couple of links for you. So looking at list three again in more detail. Dither, diver, driver, death, death and decade. So first step, we look at the first letter. So look at the first letter underlined in red there. They all begin with D, with D, don't they? Dither, diver, driver, decade, death. So that doesn't really help us very much. So we go to the second letter. Okay, in this case, I, I, R, E, E. So it, it, r, e, e. Okay, so again, we've still got more than one word with the same letter, haven't we? So it doesn't completely help us, but it does help us to order the other ones. So if we look at E as the second letter is in decade and death, that comes before I as in did that and diver. So those ones go at the beginning. Yeah. So we've got decade, death, did that, diver, and DR, driver. The R is the last letter out of the I, the E, and the R. So that comes at the end. So we've reordered this from the second letter, but we still haven't solved it. Because decade and death have the first same first two letters and dither and dive have the same two first two letters. So we've got to go a bit further. So we go to the third letter. Look at the green box at the bottom. OK, I've used highlighters this time. So we're looking at the third letter now. So in the yellow highlighted, we've got the C the K in decade and the A in death. OK, so which comes first, A or C in the alphabet? It would be the A, wouldn't it? Yeah. Then in dither and diver in the green, we've got T and V, which comes first. It's the T, so we put dither before diver. And then obviously we already know that the driver, there's only one with DR, that's going to come last because of the, the second letter, the R, coming after the others. So there's our answer. Death, decade, dither, diver, driver. Okay. It looks quite tricky when you look at a list of words, particularly if they're longer words, but it's systematic. Just keep going. Okay. You go with the first letter. If they're the same, you go to the second letter. If they're the same, you go to the third letter. If they're the same, and you just keep working through with your alphabetical order. Always start at the beginning and work your way through. Okay. That's quite a nice activity to look at with your children as well. Obviously, you'll have this recording so you can go through it with them, pause it on the screen and talk it through with them. Um, it's just a good opportunity. And once you've got that systematic approach, you can look up any words. OK, so it's really quite useful. Here's a nice idea of a home activity you could do together. Looking at your dictionary again, as I say, it'd be really good to have a paper dictionary if you possibly can. But look at what's the first word in your dictionary? What's the last word? So again, it's, it's getting used to find the, the big front and the back, the beginning and the end of your books. How do you use a dictionary? Looking at the activity we've just done. OK, so you're finding you go with the first letter first, knowing that the pages will go in alphabetical order. So if you've got the word, I don't know, watch, which begins with W, ooh, think about alphabetical order. Are you going to start looking at the front of the dictionary or towards the back of the dictionary? OK, so that's kind of some of these dictionaries are quite vast, aren't they? They're quite big. So it's about using the knowledge you've already got to help you out. If you're going to go through every single page looking for W, you're going to be there a long, long time. OK. How is it ordered? So again, thinking about the alphabet. And these are some nice, easy questions to ask your children, check their knowledge, check they know what they're doing before they have a go. So another home activity, which part of the dictionary would you need for these words? So we've got alteration, 
beginning with an A. Where would we start for that one? A bit at the beginning, wouldn't we? We've got octopus. Where would you go for that one? Somewhere in the middle? Yeah, probably open at the middle and see where you get on. And we've got gas. Okay, so that's kind of in between alteration and octopus, isn't it? So it's about, you know, you might open up at the front for alteration, the middle for octopus. You're going to go somewhere in the middle then for gas. So it's about using what you already know, making it as simple for yourselves as possible. Okay, then you ask your children to put these ones in alphabetical order and then find out the definitions. Okay, just some more nice things that you can do together. And obviously, you can change the words they're looking for. You know, you can change that as much as you like. Just get them practicing. Maybe I'll see who can do it fastest, that sort of thing. Another activity here for at home a list of words that are incorrectly spelt. So you're using a dictionary to find the correct spelling. Okay, um, quite obvious um incorrect spellings here i think beautiful attractive believe examination conscientious graduate and existence okay so again words you can look up and again so we're looking at beautiful are we going to go to the end of the dictionary or the beginning of the dictionary use what you know okay so a definition is literally what a word means okay a definition just explains what a word means in, in the simplest form okay so for instance my son asked me what a vitamin was but i realized i didn't really know so i'd go to the z page first i'd find the v's all the v's and then i'd go down until i found the i's because obviously it'd be v a v V, D, but you've got to go down to find the VIs. Okay, so you'd be scrolling through. When you get to the VIs, then we're looking at the next letter in vitamin, which is T. So all the list of the words with VI, T. So I'm going to the T. So I'm going to the second page probably with that to get to the VITs. When I get to the T, it's all A. So really, VITA, this should be towards the top of the list of the VITAs because A is the first letter in the alphabet. V I T A M, the middle of the next list. And then you'll get fewer and fewer words, obviously, possibilities as you move across. End up with your word. Okay. And I'm going to show you this link to the Collins Dictionary. Okay, which shows us the definition. Now it's quite nice on these dictionaries because you can click on the speaker and it will read it to you. Vitamin. OK, so if you're coming across words you don't know or if um, you need some extra help with English, this can be quite useful. You can also have the American version. Vitamin. I say it slightly differently. Like this is an example. It explains what they are. It explains where you might find them. OK, again, some of these dictionaries, they're free online, but obviously you get your adverts and things which can be a bit of a pain because you don't really want your children being distracted or clicking off. Another reason why it's really useful to use um, handheld dictionaries, paper dictionaries, but but it's there and it is useful. And then you've got a video of pronunciation. So you can watch somebody say it. Which can be quite useful again. Vetamin. Okay, it can be quite useful. Um, you've got your English definition. Vetamin. Your American definition. So you've got quite, and you can look at that as well, the origins of languages and how, how it can be different. So that's a useful tool to have. Obviously, other online dictionaries are available as well, and we'll look at some some more of those useful ones. So you can find out your definitions. At. And what I'd say with online ones is all you're doing is typing a word. You kind of you run the risk of losing understanding the how we work through it by just typing a word, okay? Because you're just pressing keys, you're not working out the order in each letter point. So even if you are going to use an online one a lot. Try and get one in the house if you can. And I've got some examples here. I had to look on Amazon um, for online dictionaries. This is the cheapest one that I've found. It's a mini dictionary, so it's not going to be a massive one. It's probably this sort of size. This is my French one, which is the one I could find at home this morning. Um, but it, it will be a decent one for £3.74 at the moment. Obviously, I know the prices will change, but that's not too bad. And then they do also do children one, children's ones as well. Um, primary dictionary that's 769. So 
So it's worth having a browse and obviously these can be delivered to your home. So they're not extortionately expensive. You can obviously buy more expensive ones. This one's quite nice. It's got a thesaurus in it as well and we'll, we'll cover the um, use of the thesaurus. That's quite a useful tool as well. So for 5 55 you could have both in one book. Might be worth considering. Um, obviously you can buy them elsewhere again, but just to give you an idea of um, what, what you can access at home. Okay, so in the same way, then having a go at defining some more words. Again, another activity to do at home. Saunter is your first word. You have got defining the word saunter by going through your dictionary, starting on your S page, and you want your essays, SAU, work your way through. Polygon and deceive. Okay. Just to show you on that dictionary again for the first one. All I would literally do, click on dictionary, type in my word, so check your spelling as you go. Okay, so if you have a look, it's quite interesting actually, because as you start, obviously there's a lot of words, S-A, S-A-U, obviously the list goes further down, but just to show you, and obviously you get less and less opportunity, less and less word opportunity, the more letters you've got. So here we've got saunter. So this, shows you the third person present so it shows you the different tenses and how the verb in this case so if you saunter somewhere you walk there in a slow casual way for instance we watched our fellow students saunter into the building it's kind of sh and then kind of strolling in not rushing around okay not really uh, too concerned about how fast you go in so that's quite a good example of that okay well we're on this page as well Along with saunter here, we've got something called a synonym. It mentions here, I don't know, can you see that? So synonym for saunter is to stroll, wonder, amble, roam. Okay, synonym means another word with the same meaning. Okay, and quite often we use this when we're trying to extend children's vocabulary. We'll encourage them to use and learn synonyms, more adventurous vocabulary or just other ideas. Okay, it helps make their writing more interesting. It helps them to... Um, engage the audience better it gives them a wider vocabulary which will help them be more successful learners in general okay and communicators so synonyms and that's good now the book the second book that you'd need for that would be the thesaurus which i mentioned as this one's got a dictionary and thesaurus and we'll have a look at that one together now so it's an example of a thesaurus again you can get one online Synonym then just gives you alternative words that have the same meaning, other words with the same meaning, okay? And as I say, they can be more adventurous. They're really good for children when they're starting out with words like big, okay? It was a big dog. It lived in a big house. It had a big fence and a big garden, okay? We're trying to get children to extend upon that. We start looking up other words, okay? Again, you can get online ones, um, online versions which you find in a similar way you type in your words. So here I would type in big, click on my search, and submit it into a big. Nice again, because it will read it big. for me. It will take me to the other word if I click on it. Considerable. Okay, so it will read it for me as well. And there are other alternatives there. And obviously I can click back to my original word. So you've got, different meanings as well because obviously big is can be used for a lot of different things you've got quite a lot you can click through there again i would just say the online stuff is great but it's very instant and actually getting children to really thumb through uh thesaurus works in the same way as a dictionary in terms of being in alphabetical order so it's another good practice for that um so again i would just just bring you back to the dictionary and thesaurus you can get them separately but you can also get them together and they're not too unreasonable a price so it might be worth having a look into those. So let's have a look at some examples of this. So you can look up your own words as well in a thesaurus, okay? Online or a paper one. So let's go with big. Vast. Colossal. Gigantic. Brimming. Okay, these are all synonyms I found for big when I looked it up, okay? So these are all words I could use instead. Now you have to make sure that it makes sense. So if I was talking about the mountain there, I might say that it was 
gigantic. It was vast. It was colossal. But I probably wouldn't say it was brimming. OK, think about what brimming means in terms of being big. There you go. That swimming pool is full to the brim. It's brimming full. OK, a mountain generally. I'm not saying there isn't any water on it, but it's not filled up with water. It's not overflowing. It's not really big and brewing with water. It's just thinking about making sure our words, as much as it's great to use a thesaurus, you've still got to make sure it makes sense. And this is good for bringing us back to the dictionary so you can check your meaning as well if you need to. OK, so considering it, don't just chuck any old word in there. It's got to make sense. Otherwise, it, you lose the idea. But again, good activities for children because actually knowing the precise meanings and how words you can swap words or not is really good for improving that vocabulary because they're not just throwing these big words out anywhere they're practicing with them and they're checking their meanings which is actually really useful to make them better writers too because you're going to be far more easily understood if you're sure of the meaning of what you're writing okay so thinking about what writing is then writing come from two parts the transcription which is the actual spelling and getting the writing down yeah so it's the spelling as well as the writing down the code and the composition which is how you articulate your ideas how you choose your words so obviously you've got to get it down in order for it to actually be writing to be legible but it's about what you write to okay and again it's a bit like we talked about in the reading sessions it comes away from the robotic okay and it, it brings more in okay if you've ever read a book that you've really enjoyed, particularly fiction books, I find, you know, almost transport you off to a different world. You might be sitting in your bedroom or in a, a classroom on a cloudy day, but actually if, if the writing is good and the composition, the ideas are good and the way it's written down, the word choice is good, you can conjure up those images in your head. The Harry Potter books are brilliant for that, aren't they, with children, you know, in terms of really transporting them away to this world of magic in their own heads by the power of what you write. And their imaginations. Okay, so writing, when we actually learn to write, we progress along a continuum. It's like a sequence of things that we have to do in order to be developed into writers. Okay, we start with random marks, we think about our very young children, and we end up with conventional writing and spelling. It's not by chance, you know, we have to go through a process of certain things in order to get there. Let's have a look at the basic development stage of writing then. We've got things like scribbling. That's our early mark making, young children with a pen, dotting it around, um, colours, chalks, whatever you've got going on. Then we get some emergent writing, which is when we start getting letter-like symbols, strings of letters, start thinking about how sounds combine. So actually at this point we're, we're working at, ah, I want to say ah, that's what I want to get down on the page. And we begin to try and make that look more like a letter. Let's just start to present um, words. We think about our initial media and final sounds, transitional phrases, and then we get to our standard spelling, which is where it can be read and understood. So just to bear in mind, when young children are first making marks, whether this is you know around two years old or even before, it's not as random as it might seem. OK, they are expressing their feelings. They are developing their imagination and they're testing their ideas about the world. OK, they might well just pick up any random colour. But actually, they do start to make choices. If there are more colours on the table, you'll probably find all the lids off <laughs> and all the colours being used at once. OK, it's very early um, decision making skills. OK, these opportunities that make children. OK, and every child entitled to it, preferably not on the wallpaper, I'll admit, but it's about, you know, all children, maybe in the high chair with a piece of paper. Um, all children having that right to get themselves express themselves onto paper whatever it looks like this is very early mark making skills so this is about two and a half years we've got some random scribbles dots lines not really a plan of what they're drawing or what they're trying to get across but you know some different colors there different shapes things going in different directions about a year older we've got slightly more controlled scribbling yeah perhaps more of a thought to it you can perhaps see how the top pictures develop into that one looking at this one then so we've come to more controlled shapes maybe starting to get some figures some stick figures there almost like tadpoles with hands and feet and bodies starting to get some sort of bodies yeah and some detail on the faces can you see that
So you can sort of see how it builds up. It's not completely random that some children pick up a pencil and make scribbles and then develop to this. It's like everything else. It goes through phases. You've got to know that the pencil makes a mark on the paper in order to eventually get to this point. OK, and these bigger shapes turn to smaller shapes. Your gross motor skills, your big actions have to take place first before you can make them smaller. You know, you have to do all the stuff with the arms. You have to do the throwing and the catching. You have to do the running. You have to make the big shapes. You have to do your exercise. All these things, hula hooping on your arms, skipping, all these things. Get your body used to making these shapes reliably, which then your hands can do more carefully as fine motor skills as you develop more control over your body. It's really important that they get exposure to doing these things. Okay. Emergent writing then. So this is when it stops just being any old thing on the page and the children are beginning to try and give meaning by putting something down. Okay, so it's not necessarily clear, but you can see differences between what's there. Yeah, you can start to see that actually not every single figure looks the same. Okay, and they're beginning to make some zigzags or some circles or some lines um, that could be writing. Okay, this is how it emerges. This is a writing rubric that we use, which just gives some ideas. So again, pre-writing, we've got drawing, scribbling, random letters, and quite often no relationship between what they've written and what they're trying to say. And it doesn't progress from left to right. So it's, it's, it's random. OK, the beginning of emergent. And this is when you start to get some letter strings. Um, again, it's unlikely that the letters have got any relationship to what, what they're trying to say. It's just they've realised that, you know, there are zigzags and there are dots and there are differences. OK, they have a go at reading it back potentially. So they've got an idea of what they might have intended to write. We've got the environmental print, which is where children might copy words they can see around them. So it might be signs. You might get a fire exit written down. You might get go and stop and words like this. Um, but they are able to see the exact meaning and they are able to copy, which is a really important stage. Same as um, communicating, speaking and listening, you know, you're copying what you, what you see in this account. Then they start to write sentences, not necessarily with finger spaces or punctuation of any other type, but they start to write sentences um, and it begins to be legible. You can start to see um, what they're trying to write. You can, you can begin to fathom it. Then they start using all the beginning sounds. So when they start thinking back to the phonics that we covered, so the horse can run, the, obviously it's one of those uh, red words or the tricky words that they've probably learned. Horse for horse, can they've written and run for run. Okay. So you can see how it's beginning to build. The beginning sounds is what they'll be thinking about first. No necessary punctuation, but you can see, you can begin to fathom it. You could work it out perhaps. Then we've got some early developmental spelling, which is where, again, we've got some of those um, keywords. So your uh, red words or your tricky words, we and the and to. They've obviously been taught. Went, wooden and store or shop. Again, some finger spaces here, legible letters. You can see it's beginning to build up. Then we're going to developmental spelling. There won't always necessarily be a lot more. But again, you can see differentiation between each word. You've got some finger spaces in there. You've got some attempts at punctuation with capital letters. Not always in the right place, but they have got some. Um, quite often, I have a picture company in this. Then we're going to transitional spelling. So this is where we've got two or more sentences. Um, capital letters are generally used correctly, and the child will quite often make a matching picture again. And you can just see how it builds through. And that's quite nice. That's uh, one of the resources you'll be sent, because that kind of shows you the phases that it works through. OK, just out of interest, take a moment, just consider where you might put your children in there. Are they way beyond this? Perhaps they're older children who are, are far more further on with this. Are they children just starting out in reception? Perhaps you've got a bit of stage two. I definitely put my four year old at stage two at the moment. Um, I'm beginning to see letters, but that's because he's doing a lot of phonics work, but we're not up to writing sentences just yet. We get occasional initial sounds but it's not reliable yet. And it won't be to start with, and that's that's important to remember. Okay, this is a good opportunity for you to take a break. So just pause me and come back when you're ready. Thank you.
Okay then, welcome back. So let's look at some key vocabulary um, that your children will be using in school. So literacy, English literacy, the lesson I'll be covering, basically covers reading, writing, speaking and listening. Okay, these are the main things that are covered. And this includes your spelling and your handwriting as well within that, okay? Covers all those. Now in schools, quite often during lessons, they will have an LO or an LI, a learning objective or a learning intention. And that just explains to the children what the focus of the lesson is. And quite often they'll be shown that it'll be written on the board or in their workbooks so that they know what the focus is, what they're aiming to do. So we have Wilf and we have Walt. OK, so Wilf is what I'm looking for. So this is how a teacher, again, it will quite often be in the book or on the board. It's how the children know what the, what the success would be. So what I'm looking for, so it might be that you're using capital letters and four stops in your sentences. It might be that you can sequence a story in order. OK, and Walt, we are learning to. Very similar. Some schools you use Wilf and Walt, some use one or the other. But it's about making sure the children know what we're intending to do. It's great to have a lovely lesson, but if it's not until the very end that your children realise what you wanted them to do, you might be missing out on some learning opportunities then. Genre, different types of writing. So when we talk about genres, we might be talking about um, it could be a horror theme. It could be a fairy story theme. It could be traditional tales. It could be a magical theme. So lots of different, different, uh, different types of writing, poems, stories non-fiction, they're all different genres. Uh, your success criteria or your key features, these are the things that the types of writing must include. This For slightly older children, this is kind of, I guess, where your, your learning intentions and your will from what to come together. This is when they can understand, you know, the success criteria, the proof that you can do what's being asked of you, you will show this, 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 this and this. So in a letter, it might be about using your formal um, openers and clo closings to your letters. It might be about uh, making sure that it's formatted correctly. Chronological, we talk about something being chronological, we talk about it being in order. So writing might be organised in a sequence of events. So it might be um, a family tree. So it might go back to the 15th century and work its way down. It might be if it's a list um, of instructions, it will be in the order that you need it to go. <clears throat> when we talk about lowercase, we're talking about the small letters. So that's not the capitals. When we talk about uppercase, we're talking about those capital letters. OK. Fiction, writing that's about a made up event or time. It's a story. OK. Non-fiction genre. So this is based on fact. OK. So this could be an encyclopedia full of facts about, I don't know, um, anything really about any topic, factual, scientific based stuff. Or it could be writing a label, writing a caption writing a list, writing instructions in the simplest form of writing with younger children. So schools should put their literacy curriculum online each year um, in a year by year basis. So as parents, you can see what your children will be aiming at or beginning to cover year by year. So you, and also so you can help them at home. Um, schools tend to use a genre based or thematic based approach. So they might spend half a term doing poetry. They might spend three weeks doing instructions. They might spend a term covering the classics, they, you know, whether that's fairy stories, traditional tales with younger children, or it might be covering, they might choose one, I don't know, let's think they might choose Dick King Smith as an author and cover that for a term. OK, so schools look at how, how they choose how they do it, but they should be communicating that with you. So types of writing in school then. So this gives you an idea of how writing is taught. So shared writing is quite often done at the front of the room with the teacher at the whiteboard um, and the children sitting on the carpet or at the desks. And the teacher will show, they demonstrate very carefully how to do it. OK, so for instance, if they were, I don't know, writing um, a list of instructions, if that was what they're going to be doing, then the teacher would share it with them. She would, she would do the whole thing for them to see. OK, so the teacher might act out the procedure with the class. So making a sandwich here, it tells us about making a jam sandwich. So the teacher with input from the children would also scribe the step by step instructions. So she'd do it first and she'd use some of the real key vocabulary very clearly. She was doing, oh, I'm going to spread the butter. I'm going to cut the sandwich Um, she make sure she used all the verbs and all these words she wants to draw out and then write them down. OK, and the idea is the children can see how this the making of it has gone into this list. Okay. Usually guided writing moves on from that. So the teacher will 
demonstrate making the jam sandwich, she'll write her instructions, and then they'll go off usually into smaller groups and have a go at guided writing with it. So for instance, it might be the teacher makes a jam sandwich, demonstrates it to them all. Sometimes in schools and the children might go off, I don't know, make a ham sandwich or a cheese sandwich so that they can practice themselves. They've got the experience, the memory of what the teacher did and they build on it. And then in a small group, maybe with a, a, a teaching assistant or a teacher or another adult, they would then have a go at writing their instructions together. OK, and they might copy some of them down. This then leads to independent writing, which might be the next day the children write about how they made their ham sandwich, jam sandwich. OK, and it, they might be in a frame format. So they've got one, two, three, four, five, you know, with year one, year two children. That's quite, quite common to encourage them to get the ordering and the format, the layout correct. But they're writing from their own experience. They're writing without help. And hopefully they're quite confident because they've experienced being shown how to do it, having to go with a bit more support and experiencing the actual task. The idea is that they can then have a go at doing it themselves. And they've learned that. OK, they've learned that new skill and they can have a go. And there would probably be a number of activities over the following sessions where they could practice that, be it writing a list, writing instructions, writing a recipe, writing a letter, writing a poem. There'd be lots of practice opportunities. And through that, teachers would pick up on children who might need more support and might need another guided session, um, children who really grasp this and need something more challenging and, and can sort of use that to inform their planning as well. Just take a moment to think about your own children. Are they keen writers at school and home? And even your very young children, you know, do they like an opportunity to get chalk outside or a pencil or a pen? Or do they do they like mark making? Do they like having a go at copying your writing a list? Or um, if you've got a pen and paper doing your shopping list or talking to your children, do they, do they like to do the same thing? Are they keen to write? Do they like to sit in colour or do dot to dots? Do they like to do any of those things? Or perhaps, do you notice a boy or girl trend at all with that? I don't know if you've got more than one child or if you've got experience of working with boys versus girls. Have you noticed a trend, one being more likely or one not? Or do you not think it's gender specific? What's your experience of that? I ask you that for a good reason. It seems research has shown that younger boys are less interested in putting pen to paper. They're less keen on writing as youngsters. Interestingly, research has shown that many boys are not physically capable of writing until they're approximately the age of seven in terms of development, in terms of brain, coordination, skills, motor skills. Um, and this is why a lot of European education systems don't start formal school, school into that time. And it's interesting because actually children don't tend to be further behind for having started formal schooling later on because actually they're just more ready when they approach it so there's some some argument to be said for actually take a step back don't panic if your child's not able to write lots um but do just bear in mind if they find it difficult it's likely to turn them off to it a little bit okay there are so many different skills involved and this is really really important it's a massive task you think about all the things you have to do to be able to write. You've got to sit correctly, and that's not just your bottom in your chair, that's your back in your chair, that's your arms on the desk. You've got to be turned the right way. Is your paper turned the right way? Are you confident with one hand or the other yet? Are you confident holding your pencil yet? Have you got enough arm room? Is there a lot of noise going on? There's an awful lot to consider. That's before you've even actually started to think about, you know, what do I want to write? What letters do I need? Which way around does that letter go? Have I put a finger space in? Do I need a comma here? There's an awful lot that children have got to do to be able to write successfully. And writing is very, very hard. And it's important to bear that in mind. Um, it's not easy. It's tricky. And there's a lot to draw together. Taking all that into account, it's about those motor skills again. I, I touched on this slightly earlier. Fine motor skills, so that's the little actions. So that's quite often what you use your hands for. The gross motor skills are the jumping and the reaching and the climbing and the twisting, um, the frog jumps, all those sorts of things, the balancing. That if you think about younger children, quite often they're very into, you know, whether it's climbing hills, rolling down them, slides, swings, all those sorts of experiences. It's about, um, it's bigger than just having fun. It's about 
feeling themselves and where they they sit and all the impacts of forces and you know gravity and and they don't know this but it's about them trying to find themselves in the world and and knowing you know if I cause and effect if I did this this happens it's about very young children trying to work all these things out okay from an early stage the gross motor is really important first and again, this idea that sometimes up until the age of seven, for some children, actually, they're not ready to be able to do this in such a concentrated manner. But there's things we can do to help. And the gross motor, which is, you know, the big arm movements and the big letters that you could do on the pavement in chalk and the, um, I'm talking about what they're called, pom-poms that you can spin round or the hula hoops you can spin on your arm or on your waist, the bean bags you can balance on your head, the jumps you can do. Um, how fast can you go down the slide? How fast can you run up the steps, lean against the wall, lifting up your bottom from the chair? All these things help your body to work out where it is, how much force it needs and what it can do. And if you can do that big, then when it comes to writing, whether that's at five or six, whatever age your child really comes to it, it will make it far easier. If they can do the big shapes it's far easier then to do the small ones if they've got experience the big ones and one of the things I'll send you out um with the slides today are some nice ideas for some fine motor uh, skills example so it's not just get a pencil and sit and write actually it's about using their fingers for other things it's a couple of examples here making fingerprints on the paper doing noughts and crosses make it a game it's not sit there and write me two sentences because you know what I'm over it but actually, if they can do noughts or crosses or a marks like it, they are made. It's a zero or an O and an X, isn't it? You know, they are working towards it. So don't get fooled into thinking these things are play. My child's now at school. We don't do that anymore because actually play is still really important. You know, play is very purposeful and very, very important. And I know we've touched on this a bit over the last few weeks. And don't forget that, OK, because if they can do these things and enjoy and engage with these things, it's going to make it far easier for them to write than if they're just completely turned off and just it's something they have to do that they find really difficult. So there's some nice activities there that you can maybe have a go with as well. So some creative writing exercises, so different types of text in school. So. It's not all about writing stories. It's not all about writing lists. There's lots of different things they have to do. OK, so letter writing. Both formal and informal, so your letters that which might be to apply for um, a job or to write to the head teacher, but also your letters which might be a quick note to a friend or a letter to somebody you already know. So formal and informal there. Poetry, lots of different types of poetry that you can look at. Um, you've got your things such as your um, limericks and your um, acrostic poems you've got more formal poems you've got longer and shorter poems poems that rhyme poems that don't persuasive text this is might be a newspaper report it might be trying to convince somebody to do something information text they're more your, they're your factual texts your non-fiction recounts which might be recalling something that happened could be a newspaper report for instance instructions telling somebody how to do something and descriptive that's more your story so there's a lot of different genres here that children will cover in school and over the year groups as well they'll revisit them they don't just do poetry in year one and that's it for instance they will revisit and they will build on the skills that they gain so let's look at some of these types of texts with some real life examples and the success criteria so the example will be in red and what the school are looking for what the children need to demonstrate they can do will be in purple so information texts picture of a timetable there so we've got leaflets food packaging timetables factual books posters flyers maps and letters these are all examples of information text okay key features then they will quite often have clear headings so that you can see what's going on there they'll be fact-based use different text sizes if you have a look at that um timetable there on the right in the picture You've got your numbers very large. I'm guessing those are the numbers of the, the buses or the trams. You've got your highlighted parts that you can see clearly and your headings are larger. Pictures and diagrams, quite often you have content and an index, particularly in your factual stuff and a glossary. And separate separated out information to make it easy to read. Yeah, so that you can quickly find what you need. Instruction texts, such as recipes, DIY leaflets, and instructions maybe for a game or a craft so they need to be easy to read they need to follow in a logical order quite often they'll be numbered again you have different text sizes for your titles um, and your sections 
as you can see on the map there, tells you what you need in bullet points and numbers. There might be short sentences. Some of these imperative verbs, you command, so put, place, after, before, may include images. Persuasive writing, such as charity flyers, your junk mail, posters, election leaflets, sales promotions, letters and adverts. These are good examples of persuasive writing, trying to convince us of something. I have emotive language in them. Powerful verbs, quite often I have pictures. Personal appeal, you can help, your life will be better, okay? Looking at this advert here, give clothes, make a fashion statement. Thinking about our imperative verbs there, encouraging us to do something. Give. Give clothes, make a fashion statement, take a stand against poverty. So these are our imperative verbs telling, verbs telling us what to do, okay? Take a stand against poverty by donating your unwanted clothes. Personalising it drawing us in okay descriptive writing examples of this so in storybooks i've described to try and conjure up the setting quite often for us and novels travel books holiday brochures food packaging holiday brochures are a great one for this trying to make us really take to a certain area or a certain resort trying to draw us in and really make us want to go just with pictures in a brochure um, and the way that it describes it. You might have long paragraphs and some complex sentences, interesting words, adjectives and adverbs, and the images are quite useful as well, aren't they? They draw you in, okay? It kind of gives you an extra clue, doesn't it? And also, if your thinking's going one way, it might turn your thinking back the other way, yeah, which can be very useful things like holiday brochures where they're trying to get you to spend money. Um, can be quite useful. Okay, this is quite a nice game that you can play at home as well, a story game say it in turn so once upon a time i went on holiday to barbados linking this to the holiday theme one day my face turned red in the sun unfortunately it began to blister luckily the doctor on the island gave me some soothing cream finally after a few days it went back to normal it's quite a nice way of practicing your different sentence openings um, making it more interesting and it encourages you to sort of come up with some ideas Okay, so you could take it in turns. So you would say one, the next person, so you do once upon a time, the next person would do one day. You do unfortunately, the next person would do luckily. Good fun. And you can do it verbally again, so you could do it verbally, then go and write it down. A bit of guided writing there as well. Report writing, linked to information. So this could be diaries, newspapers and magazines, newsletters. Okay, so again, more factual stuff. Okay, I have to think both about the formal and non-formal. Uh, chronological and non-chronological. So in a diary, you would expect things to be in order. In a newspaper, you'd expect it to be recent events that you were reading about. Um, headlines, nice and big, draw you in, make sure you know what's going on. Different text sizes, pictures and photos, emotive language again to try and draw you in and gain your interest. Mixture of fact and opinion, definitely newspapers and some quotes. People have said, people have interviewed who were there. Again, give you more information, draw you in. Letter writing, so it might be to make a complaint, it might be a postcard that you're sending, it might be to keep in touch with somebody, it might be formally to request information. Um, it could be formal or informal again. Your address will go in the top top left will be their address, the top right will be your address. Whether you use dear or to, so if it's a formal letter it would be dear, sir or madam generally because you wouldn't normally know who they were, or to if it's informal. You miss a line before you start again. Put your uh, sentence into paragraphs and then choice between yours faithfully or yours sincerely. Again, yours faithfully tends to go in a formal letter where you've done your dear sir or madam and yours sincerely tends to go with two when you do know who you're writing to. Poetry then, a huge variety of poems. Put this in cane, haiku, acrostic. Um, and they use imagery, so they tell us what something looks like. They use similes and metaphors, really powerful to describe something as being like something else or as something else. Uh, wow words and rhyme. Not all poems have to rhyme. Uh, our very early poems that we do with children and nursery rhymes and things obviously do, but they don't have to rhyme. Poems don't have to rhyme. That's worth being aware of. We teach our children to make writing more interesting. 
Okay, it's not just about you must use a different word. It's about making it more interesting, more engaging, um, and helping them to be better communicators, more interesting, engaging communicators. One way to do that is to vary our sentence structure. Okay, so if you start too many, many sentences with the same word, so the, it, this, I, everybody nods off. I saw Molly at the cinema. I went on Thursday. I sat in seat 16. I like going to the cinema. I had a good time. It is boring, isn't it? It is boring. So we have to try and encourage children to vary. Mix it up a bit, make it more interesting. It was such a coincidence to meet Molly at the cinema. Let's try some more of these. I ended up sitting by Molly at the cinema. These are all going to be alternatives to that. Yesterday, when I went to see Paddington, I was surprised to find my cinema seat was next to Molly. Very different, gave us a bit more information. When I sat down at the cinema, I realised that I was sitting next to Molly. Molly and I, without any advanced planning, ended up sitting next to each other at the cinema. Different again. Unbelievable, I know, but Molly and I ended up sitting right next to each other at the cinema. A bit more exciting again. Even more detail this time. At the crowded cinema packed with 300 people, Molly and I ended up, by sheer coincidence, sitting right next to each other. Okay, far more engaging than I ended up sitting by Molly at the cinema. I have known many coincidences in my life, but none more surprising than finding myself sitting next to Molly at the cinema. How surprising it was to find that I was sitting right next to Molly at the cinema. Okay, so just a bit of a point there that there are so many different sentence structures and openers that you can use and how, you know, some of that's more suitable for one audience than another. When I sat down at the cinema, I realised I was sitting next to Molly. Yeah, one children. I have no many coincidences in my life, but none more surprising than finding myself sitting next to Molly at the cinema. Certainly more key stage two, I think. OK, but it just goes to show how you can use one idea and draw it out. So another thing to consider is sentences with the same rhythm and length can be very boring. We went to Chester Zoo. We went to look at the bats. It was dark in the bat cave. The bats were beautiful. Some bats were flying around our heads. Some bats were sleeping upside down. Bethany was scared at first. Later she brought a cuddly bath. Again, it's that rhythm, isn't it? It's da 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 and that's probably what you're hearing rather than the words, okay? Not very adventurous. We would be encouraging children to build on that, okay? Really nice for sort of reception year one, don't get me wrong, but we would be encouraging them to extend that out, make it more interesting to the reader. The cat went along the wall. Boy, not very much information there, is there? Wow well, words, some of our adjectives and verbs. A fluffy ginger cat prowled along the red brick wall. Okay, so in our heads, we know what the cat looks like. We know the colour of it. We know the style of it. We know how it's walking and we know what the wall looks like. Just a few extra words can really conjure up far more of a picture in your head. And by doing that, you kind of always want to know what's happening next. Whereas when the cat's just walking across the wall, oh, great, yeah. And the fly flew that way. No, it's about trying to engage and make it more exciting. We can use connectives. So to join sentences, clauses or phrases with a connective so and but so because if yet yeah, however there's lots of them let's look at this the fluffy ginger cat prowled along the red brick wall because he was spying on a juicy bird it gives us more information doesn't it yeah we know a bit more already of what he's doing thinking about our sentence openings then we can use time connectives ed words ly words whilst licking his lips the fluffy ginger cat prowled along the red brick wall because he was spying on a juicy bird. It gives us more information about what's going on again. It makes it more interesting, more detail. Thinking about our punctuation then, our punctuation pyramid. How can we put some of that in? Whilst licking his lips, the fluffy ginger cat, who had sharp teeth, prowled along the red brick wall because he was spying on a juicy bird. Okay, we've got our brackets in there. We've got our exclamation mark in there. We've got some commas in there. OK, so again, you can sort of begin to see how this builds up. Use of short and long sentences. Let's go back to that visit to Chester Zoo. 
and let's have a look how we can combine some long and short sentences together and look at the impact that has. Class 6 visited Chester Zoo last summer to look at the bats. In the darkness of the bat cave, they met a variety of beautiful nocturnal creatures, some fluttering soundlessly around their ears and others resting upside down in the darkest corners. Bethany had been worried, but after learning more and seeing the bats in their home, she became very fond of them. She later left the zoo, clutching a cuddly toy bat. Quite different, isn't it? Long ones, short ones, different sentence openers, more descriptors, more punctuation. Different types of sentence then. So simple sentences, Alex enjoy going to the show with you. A compound sentence, Alex enjoy going to the show with you as you made him laugh. Okay, so it's putting in something, two sentences that could go together. Alex enjoy going to the show with you, you made him laugh. We can combine them, we can compound them. Henry VIII is famous for having had six wives. Henry VIII is famous for having had six wives and for having two of them beheaded. Okay. It just gives more detail, makes it more interesting, makes it more complicated sentences. Now, complex sentences, aren't, these aren't compound, they're complex, more, more complicated. In his quest for an heir to the, th the throne, Henry VIII married six different women, two of whom he divorced, two he had beheaded, one died and one survived. So this has got a lot more to it, a lot more clauses to it. And looking at this, adding an extra clause can give more information. It's called an embedded clause. This is where we can either use our commas or our brackets. OK, so Jenny finally made it to the party. Let's look at the red bit. Jenny, who had spent 45 minutes waiting for a taxi, finally made it to the party. OK, gives us a bit more information. Not Jenny finally made it to the party, so we don't know if she was working late. We don't know if she always gets up late in the morning. We don't know if she got no clothes to wear. Jenny, who had spent 45 minutes waiting for a taxi, finally makes the party. Now we know some idea of the time. We know why. We've got some reasoning. All in the same sentence. Six children took part in the dance. Let's try that again. Six children, each wearing a mask of their own design, took part in the dance. OK, so the green part this time just gives us more of an idea. So it's not just a dance everybody's been chugged along to. This time they're wearing their own masks and they're taking part in the dance. OK. Just to give you a bit more of an idea. So. Just clicking on my notes here. One second. Let's see if you can do it then. Sally wants a scooter for Christmas. Flying in the aeroplane, he could see the clouds. Choose one of those and just have a go. See if you can embed a clause with some commas in there. Take a moment to see if you can do that. need a bit more time you could always pause it here do you manage to do it so sally who had been good all year wants a scooter for christmas sally who is really jealous of her best friend mary wants a scooter for christmas flying the air in the airplane tom who had been terrified of flying for five years could see the clouds Flying the aeroplane above the stars, you can see the clouds. Just give a bit more detail, OK? Another activity to try at home with the children. So this week we have covered dictionary and thesaurus skills. We've had a look at writing development and how those gross and fine motor skills are important. Please have a go with the activities um, for those. That, that should be really useful. We've looked at different writing purposes in schools and the different types of things covered, which hopefully you've got some more vocabulary now that will help with that and ideas for improving writing. Um, just to show you on the top mark site, um, they've got some really nice different writing activities here, but I'm going to show you this one, which is a pop star puzzle. It takes a while to load to have really done it, but have a look at this one. I wonder where Ricky Reverb has disappeared to. 
It will be the biggest story of the year if I can find out what's really going on. Will you help me investigate the story? This is the idea of this is that how you've got your different types of um, text here. So you've got your newspaper, you're going to go on an investigation. Select the bin to see if Rick is there any way evidence that might give a clue. Select each item of garbage. So here you've got your, your diary. Look, you've got an invitation. You've got your diary. The first clue is filled for you. So on the 15th of July, magazine article told him about the release of Ricky's new CD. So he's got an invitation here. Let's read it. So we've got, so was it the 10th of June, the 10th of July? So it was the 10th of July, 8 p.m. 10th of July, 8 p.m. Let's get that correct. It was a magazine article. Now, was it an invitation to dinner, an invitation to a party, or an invitation to Papa Woods? Let's read it carefully. So you go through the clues and it helps you discover who did it. There's some, again, some nice games on here. Again, it's about getting children to read for detail, read for clarity. You've got a nice comic book one here. Um, another newspaper report about different, you've got your nouns and adjectives, you've got your grammar and your punctuation covered as well. Um, a lot of these are good for your older children um, because it's just a bit more interesting. Instructions, it develops things a bit further. Letters, myths and legends, story planning, non-fiction. Again, talking children who aren't necessarily all into stories because not everybody is. But some different ideas there. It's certainly worth you giving a try to. seem to have left where we were. And it just whizzes back to where, where we've gotten to. There we go. No, it's not going to let me do this, I'm afraid. I'm going to have to just whiz us back there and I apologise for that. It's doing its own thing a little bit. Um, so there's my email address again. Should you have any questions? It's another wordy week. It's a week with quite a lot of content to it. Um, but hopefully, again, as and when your children start covering these things, that will make it, it will be more obvious to you. And you will find it easier to go, go back and delve into these and, and sort of go, oh, yeah. OK, we're doing something about they're doing guided writing at school. This is how I could support them or, you know, this is how they're extending their sentences. This is how I could support them. Hopefully these things will, will be useful for you to understand then and the vocabulary as well. You just take a moment to look at where you put yourself now, think about writing, how you feel about where you're at and anything in the session that's been helpful or you'd like more help with. We are at the end of the, the course now, so really useful time to get some feedback for ourselves as well as obviously we take these courses forward and it looks like more and more is going to be delivered online at the moment so it'd be really useful to sort of find out how it's worked for you and anything else that you'd like obviously if I can send you any more resources or anything I will so please do let me know so over the course of the last six weeks um, of school English and then obviously five weeks before that on phonics we've learned quite a bit and here's just a run round of some of it our phonics so our vocabulary, phases one to six to be covered and how it's taught, reading at home, reading at school, some spelling week, a punctuation week, a grammar week. We've done all of our writing, lots of activities and ideas to help children, lots of websites and hopefully some things that will improve their self-confidence and help you to understand where they might be at with things, which I think is really, really important. Um, as we're at the end of the course, we do ask you to fill out an evaluation and I'd really appreciate it if you could. Um, I'll email it out to you and obviously if you can just email it back to me, that'd be great. Also, if there are any of the activities you've had a go at that you wouldn't mind sharing any photos you've got of things you've made or of your children enjoying an activity, etc. Um, that'd be great. If you'd be happy to share, that'd be really lovely um, so we could see how it helps. Uh, further training, we have more courses available that may be of use to you so you can follow this link here which will give you some more um, courses that are out there and we do have an awful lot that we deliver um, so please do do have a look I hope you've enjoyed the course um, I hope the videos have been useful to you um, anything further please do feel free to drop me an email please do send those evaluations back um, and good luck I hope you find this useful and um, your children do really well at school thank you very much bye bye